title is provocatively, Are We Fleecing the Young? So please help me to welcome Lauren Lamaske. Thank you. Thank you. It is really terrific to be here, but you don't really have to welcome me. Um, I was astounded when I flew in Saturday to see all the people coming into Raleigh-Durham Airport and even standing in lines at, I think, in Chapel Hill, I guess, to, to greet me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, gee, those people in Chapel Hill looked so happy when I saw them the next day. Uh, so uh, I'm really delighted to be here. There are so many people that I know and respect at this institution. Um, I don't know many of you, but if you're PPE students, I certainly have a great deal of respect for you. Um, don't tell my colleagues at Virginia, but PPE is really a lot better than doing PPL. Today, I would like to talk with you about something which, if I do it real successfully, you might not be happy. You might not be happy with me and the other old people here. Uh, because what I'm going to be talking about is how the old, not in their individual capacity, but in terms of how we as a society operate various institutions, create transfers, create burdens on some to benefit others. And surprise, surprise, uh, the burdens I'm going to be talking about are the ones that younger people carry. That will include Social Security, because that's kind of an obvious thing. If you work in a regular job, and, you know, I hope you never have to. <laughs> Much better to do what you're doing here and now than to actually get employed. But, oh, I'll talk about that too. But if you do, you know that they remove from your paycheck some amount, which they don't even call it social security. They have more obscure initials, but basically uh, there's an idea that that's for your retirement. But that's not true. It's for my retirement because the money that comes in from that doesn't uh, get stored away in a box or even uh, purchasing securities. It goes out almost immediately to pay for current uh, older people. They don't even have to be retired ones. I'm an example, so thank you for helping me out. I use it for this Diet Coke today. Uh, but w this is just one kind of transfer, but of course uh, that is not uh, something new uh, to, to uh, this generation. When I was your age, I had to pay in and uh, that money went to the yet older one. And so, so what's the problem with this? Well, we'll talk about it in a little while. But I want to mention other things that may not be quite as obvious. Um, when you purchase something, goods or services, one way to get that thing is to employ current resources. They do, you pull cash out of your pocket. Or if you're the state, you uh, tax people to provide this. But there's another way to secure, to secure these goods, and that's to borrow to get them, to incur debts, to, yeah, people throw things at me all the time, but, at two anomaly? <laughs> Part of the show. No. no. Talk about being all wet. Uh, 
Uh, all right, I completely lost my uh, borrow. my thread. Borrow. Borrow. Yeah, do borrow. Uh, as a country, uh, we pay for a whole lot of things through borrowing. Some of them long-standing capital goods, all right. But others, and one I want you to think about, is commitments for pensions to workers who have put in X number of years and then leave the job, and who then receive money the rest of their lives. This is a case in which a certain amount is being expended each year on people who during that year are providing no services and maybe haven't for a decade or two, and yet the expenditure uh, is part of their, of their contract. Now, so what? You borrow, you pay back. But note in this case, in this case, that uh, you, uh, younger taxpayers, will be forking over for services that didn't occur perhaps during your lifetime, but you're still on the hook for them. I want to talk a little bit more about how this works and the kind of debt involved. As it happens, when I was flying in here, I was reading, I think, an issue of The Economist from two weeks ago, talking about the pension crisis in Brazil. And the good news is that we are better off in this regard here than in Brazil. The uh, less good news is if you're from Illinois, you're not a lot better off. You're really in a lot of trouble. Anybody from Illinois? You did a great thing coming to North Carolina. However, North Carolina is not in great shape either. And we can talk about this. But basically, expenditures on things like firefighters, teachers, uh, God help us, even university professors can uh, impose bills on others many, many years later. Let me mention one other thing that might seem less distant to you. In the United States, we now have a much lower unemployment rate than when I started to think about these issues, but it's still the case that for young workers, their rate of unemployment is approximately double what it is for the workforce in general. Uh, I don't know how much impact that figure has on you because, frankly, if you're a Duke or UNC grad, I would say your prospects are going to be pretty good. But, of course, not everybody is so fortunate. And, and therefore, there's a kind of worrying unemployment rate for young people in the U.S. taking longer to get into the regular workforce, but it's nothing like it is in, for example, Italy, where the young are really hurting. I mean, with, with rates upwards of 20%. But that's not nearly as bad as in Spain or, of course, Greece. As a general rule, if something's bad anywhere, it's twice as bad in Greece. Uh, why is it that labor markets are such that young people do less well in them than older ones? Uh, there are all these different policy things to talk about. I'm not going to try to make you sit through my analysis of all of these. I mention these now. I understand we'll have a time where we could talk back and forth together. People may or may not throw soda cans at me. I don't care. Uh, but I'll be glad to talk about whichever of these you would like to. Let me just add, though, this isn't bad enough. I'm now inclined to think that 
on top of all these specific burdens on the young, in general, policy formulation, activities taken by our government and others has a built-in systemic bias in favor of the old vis-a-vis -vis the young. Uh, give you just one very quick example that you would think has nothing to do with this kind of transfer. Think of Obamacare, which despite the wishes, perhaps, of people who moved into Washington recently, still obtains. Um, and it's terrific in some ways, less terrific in others. We could debate about that the rest of the afternoon. But one thing that is not debatable here is that Obamacare, through the individual mandate and requirements for pricing, effects large transfers from the young, that is actuarially, presumptively healthier, less demand on the system, to transfer it to the old. Why? Well, uh, let me put these out there as questions for you, but I'm not a policy one, I'm a philosopher, and it's time I bring in some philosophy. And uh, you should all have this handout. You don't really need it. The reason I prepare handouts, and I think it's a public service, is to prevent me from using PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> PowerPoint, I think, has done more damage to uh, speaking than anything uh, in my lifetime. I think the inventors of PowerPoint and elevator music are maybe the worst human beings <laughs> of the past. Well, all right, Kim Jong-un, but uh, it's pretty close there. Anyhow. If there are any North Koreans here that I insulted you, I apologize. Um, but uh, on the handout, you'll see I know three principles of justice, and I'm not going to try to work these all out now. I'm sure if you've been in the PPA class, you've talked about these in some way. If you haven't, then probably you wouldn't be here if you didn't have some interest or background in this. But one principle is reciprocity, where simple as case, simple trade. I trade my Diet Coke for this empty can. No, I wouldn't do that. Um, an apple for an orange, each partner to it believes to be making himself better off by doing so. It's win-win. Um, Activities that involve genuine reciprocity, mutual advantage, these don't necessarily satisfy the justice bar, but that's good presumptive indicator that what's going on is kosher. Um, and this can take different forms. The simple kind I mentioned, but there could also be a case where A does something good for B, who does something good for C, who does something good for A, or in the kind of case that interests me here, that of generational stuff, you know, your parents have invested a lot in you. You know, you weren't much economic value to them when they took you home from the hospital. They had to buy you clothes, feed you, put up with who knows what, but when they tell you, well, you owe them for that, what you should do is remind them that their parents had to put in a similar amount for them. And if they play their cards right, you might do so for any kids you have and such. So each generation is the beneficiary of, of certain kinds of care and consideration, which it then provides for the next one along, nobody without. Mm -hmm. So all of these are kinds of reciprocity we can point to. Failures of reciprocity 
demand attention. There, there is a question of whether some party is being exploited. Uh, let me mention a second thing I put on there, perhaps less uh, familiar to Probably I should come up with a better term than non-imposition, but it means you know, if you have garbage, your yard, don't dump it on somebody else's. You shouldn't be imposing your costs on others. The activity of shedding costs onto others is another thing that is presumptively, uh, presumptively uh, uh, to you know, to be regretted and maybe to be criticized on grounds of justice. And finally, I want to talk a little bit of politics. Uh, we are a democracy. I know that there are some people who after November have questioned that and people who have never in their lives paid any attention to the Electoral College are now uh, damning it for various things. But we are a democracy. We have, uh, we have a kind of commitment to the idea of individuals making their own private determination. But sometimes we have to do things as a society. And when we do, rather than doing so uh, at the will of one uh, authority or some ruling clique. Rather, we ought to take determinations through democratic means of uh, letting the majority direct the activities of the state. And at this point, I can't uh, help, well, I can't help, but I take the opportunity, bring in words for my boss, uh, Thomas Jefferson, founder of the University of Virginia, and still eerily present among us in so many ways. Uh, <coughs> one of his most more problematic sayings, that little quote here in the note to, to his good friend James Madison, us saying that all laws, all constitution, ought to have a sunset clause in them after 19 years. Why 19 years? Well, it's a prime number, but I'm not sure that's it. Why would it be 19 years? May I ask your students? It's a generation back then. If no, I won't say it, but uh, probably nine, if you're 19, that doesn't mean you need to get busy with the new generation now. But the idea is that the dead hand of the past should not be ruling contemporary individuals. They had a chance to establish system of laws as they saw fit. Why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't we all? Why should the founding one be privileged? Well, this got Mr. Madison worried a lot. He had worked real hard on uh, coming up with the principles of the Constitution and trying to stop. While Jefferson at that time was off in France acquiring furniture and paintings and gourmet food and such, so he didn't quite have the same experience. Madison didn't care for that suggestion, and neither should we, because in a way, if you think of laws as like an enduring capital good, you wouldn't blow up bridges after 19 years if they're still serviceable or you know, other kinds of productive assets. Why would you do it with laws? But, all right, uh, even if the Jeffersonian position can't be accepted in its entirety, it does have a certain bite to it. And the bite is this, that to the extent that an earlier generation 
rather than providing some general public good to the extent that it uses its privileged position to impose on later ones for its own benefit, then that really is something to be questioned. Do earlier generations ever do that, though? Let's go back to the example that I started with. Social Security is one of the, I can't think of too many bore, more boring things to talk about to 20-something people than Social Security. If we had an AARP meeting going on here, you know, with the bingo game before that and uh, blood pressure medicine after, you know, we old people, we can get off on that kind of thing. I don't expect you to, and that's probably just as well. But basically, this goes back to the 1930s uh, and involved workers uh, for the first time being taxed, quite a light tax actually, to provide benefits for old people, usually retired, uh, especially then. But um, at that time, it, you know, it had so much going for it, in part because there were so many more people paying in than taking out of it. Well, I don't have to tell you that that's not exactly the same now that the ratio of workers paying in to those taking money out has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller over time. I don't have to tell you the demographics are such that as baby boomers reach the eligibility age, retire, the amount that's going to have to be forthcoming from those still in the workforce grows. grows. Um, and you know, a bit of what I think of as good news, actually, as people live longer and longer, the, the uh, uh, total liability grows then. So uh, all I'll say about this, well, I'll say two things about that. First, it's pretty clear that Social Security, as it now exists, is not entirely sustainable. Either more will have to be extracted from the young, but it's already pretty high, or benefits will uh, have to go down. This is just arithmetic. I'll point out that um, we don't exactly have a bashful new administration, but uh, the one thing that it was said would not be decreased, not be reformed, our transfer payment. That means Social Security, Medicare mostly. I'm not going to talk about Medicare now, but if people want to, we can. Um, note also that it was pretty easy to get into Social Security through democratic means. But basically, sort of revolution, impossible to get out of because the liability is already there. If you think that that's worrying, much more so are the liabilities incurred from public pensions. Most pensions these days, leaving Social Security aside, are different from this. Uh, workers uh, have some money taken out of their current paycheck going into a 401k account or some other kind, and eventually in the fullness of time, they've saved up some money and then they start withdrawing it later on. That's not the way it is for, almost, I'm gonna say almost all, but certainly the great majority of public employers. The way public employment works is that you are, a guaranteed certain retirement income based on length of service, so five years, no, not much, 25 years, yep, lot, maybe to a maximum of 30 or so, and final salary. And once you then start claiming this, 
it's owed to you, courtesy of the taxpayers of the state or the city, forever. What happens is precisely what PPE students in this room will expect to happen. There are incentives at work. We can either tax ourselves now to put more money in a retirement fund for uh, people who will eventually retire and receive the money, or we can not put so much in and we can leave it to people 10 or 20 years down the road to provide the money. Which would you do if it were coming out of your pocket or the person who lives where you're living now 20 years from now? Um, well, you're very good people, so maybe you're an exception in this regard. But in most jurisdictions, pension funds are scandalously underfunded. And uh, this is something you shouldn't worry about. You have a spring break to look forward to. Worry about that instead. Right? But, you know, it's going to happen. It is happening. And um, I guess it would be unfair to point to Detroit as a harbinger of what the United States will experience over and over again because Detroit is to us what Greece is to Europe, but there are other places that are in almost as bad shape. And once you get into that, there's no easy way out of it. Let me just mention something that I think is a more direct concern to you, and that's work. And again, uh, I'm going to be very brief on this, and I'd be, I want to leave as much time as possible to talk with you about whatever interests you. But um, younger people have a harder time getting jobs. The unemployment rate for youth is, as I say, roughly double that of uh, the overall workforce. Why? Well, here's uh, one reason. You know, if you're a new worker, presumably you're not as good at a certain kind of job as somebody with more experience at it, right? Who, and also, you're not as reliable as somebody who has, say, put in five years at work without burning anything down or you know, throwing Coke cans around or anything in the process. So, you know, you're not worth as much to an employer as this older person. That makes sense, doesn't it? You might wish you were getting as much as that person, but that would, uh, that's wishful thinking. That explains why young people have a harder time getting hired onto a job, right? Good, I tricked you, uh, because that isn't right, actually. The thing that, that you should be thinking is, well, yeah, maybe the productivity of the 20-year-old is only half that of the 30-year-old, but therefore, therefore, you would expect that 20-year-olds would, would secure a salary half that of the 30-year-olds. They wouldn't have a harder time getting hired. They wouldn't make as much, right? If you're, anybody here going to become a neurosurgeon? No? Because you wouldn't make as much as a hedge fund manager. Okay. Uh, but, you know, if you're a neurosurgeon, you're probably going to make a lot more money than if you, uh, if you mop the floors in the operating theater. Well, we don't have any trouble understanding that. Right? Lower productivity means lower return. So the question for you is why don't the young get jobs at basically the same rate as their seniors 
subject to being paid a smaller amount. You tell me all your students would know the answer to that. Half of them. Two of them? All right. Uh, you're being very polite. I bet you do know. And you figure, Lamasky, it's your job to give the talk. Mine to sit here and listen to it. Fair enough. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Right? One reason that you won't be paid, say, half as much as somebody else is because we have, we have floors to the minimum amount that can be paid for an employee. This is minimum wage law protection. So suppose it's $10 an hour. There's strong move to make it 15 and in some places it already is 15 if somebody else is twice as productive as you and getting paid, let's say, $25 an hour, and you would take that job, if you could, at half that pay, but you can't if the minimum wage is 15. But in addition, there are a whole lot of other things involved. And this too is kind of a boring topic, I guess, but if you study labor economics, you will learn that there are all sorts of rigidities in the labor market. So for example, along with salary, you have to provide certain kind of benefits to workers, and these tend to be pretty much the same, whether it's high wage worker or low wage, things like health care, insurance, unemployment, compensation, and so on. Plus, it can be real easy to hire someone, but really difficult to fire them. Uh, as my unfortunate colleagues at UVA know, it's almost impossible to fire me. I have tenure. Right? And therefore, all they can do is just you know, be happy when I go south to North Carolina and I'm away for a few days, but it's not only university professors who are in that situation. In many, many jobs, especially civil service ones, uh, but others too, it's either impossible or very difficult and costly to let someone go. So, and even more so in most of Europe. So, what would you do in hiring? You could hire the young person who's, who is relatively riskier for a job, you could hire for a lot, but if this person works out, that's great, but if she doesn't, you will find extraordinarily costly to uh, relieve her of that. Or you could hire the older person, not great, pretty undistinguished record, but at least 10 years, 20 years of some kind of reliability. And so there is a great tendency to protect the jobs of those who already have them. And no surprise, that's fa something that favors the relatively old vis-a-vis -vis the young. And that's why, especially in Europe, right, uh, there is an unemployment crisis among the young. People get out of college, not as good as the UNC Duke, but pretty good ones with decent degrees and have an awful time getting jobs because the markets are structured such that if you're in a job, you're pretty secure. If you're not, Good luck to you. A lot of them used to think of this as a real good reason to move to more dynamic places. Where would you move to if you're in Spain, say? One good place to go to is England. Oops, we just did a Brexit thing. That's not working so well for them anymore. Well, even, even better than that. 
the United States. We would never shut our borders to talented young people who want to come on board. Yeah, right. Um, so these are all things that I think are genuinely cause for alarm. Look, I could go on for a long time on this, but let me try to tie some things together. I just mentioned the Brexit folk. You all know what I'm talking about, Brexit, Britain, exit, Brexit. Uh, the first word was Grexit. That didn't take place yet, but I'd be willing to bet people here that it will within maybe five years. Um, and uh, Professor Anomaly will pay my losses if I'm wrong. Uh, one of the interesting things about that Brexit vote is that the population of those for and against was not homogeneous. And that along several dimensions, but the one I'm interested in, you might not be surprised, is that of age. What do you think? Did younger voters, those under 30, did they favor the majority to leave the EU or want to remain in? How many thinks they wanted to leave the EU? Damn, this is a hard group to fool. Yeah, of course you're right. It was maybe two-thirds or more of the young. Now, in our recent election, similarly, there was a strong divergence between the votes of the under 30 uh, population and the, and the overall electorate, or the older ones. Uh, and as you might guess, uh, it was, it was uh, against Mr. Trump for young voters and as opposed to you know, the Clinton voters. Uh, well, so what? That's why they call these elections. You always have some who win, some who lose. Different, different groups, different geographical entities will vote different. Anybody surprised that California votes differently than South Carolina? So I'm not surprised by that. But uh, the demographics of age in this regard I find significant. And I'll tell you why, and I can't prove this, and it's something I'm looking into. And I may be wrong about this. But what I think is that if you've reached a certain stage of life, you know, where basically you've achieved pretty much the kinds of stuff you can expect to achieve, and you've attained a standard of life that maybe is an ideal, but you're kind of comfortable with it, the <clears throat> older you are, the more risk-averse you will be to losing that. Things that shake things up, either in the economy or just who might move into your neighborhood next year. All these things, you're going to be more conservative about it. You'll want to put that aside if you can, through private means, I guess, but if you have an opportunity through democratic procedures to do so, well, maybe that too. On the other hand, if you're young, you're going to be more likely to be willing to risk certain things, to, to accept a certain period of upset, change, and so on, because change might not be immediately to your benefit, but a stagnant society you know won't be. You don't want to become Japan, so, even though Japan is not a terrible place. Hmm? Are you from Japan? I, I should have stuck with North Korea in my prepared remarks, but, right? But, uh, you know, stagnation at that kind of level, it's not uh, the worst thing. But 
if you're younger, in general, you are going to be less risk averse. You will rationally trade a certain current uh, upset and risk for the sake of prospects of greater future growth. You should do that with your investments. You should do it with your life in general. But what happens in democracy, though, is that, well, frankly, you guys don't do a good job of organizing to get out at the polls to vote in high numbers. And one reason you don't is because you have a life, right? There are things that are more interesting to do. Doing your PPE ratings are more interesting. And if that's true, what isn't? So, uh, you know, whereas if you're old, you know, there's only so much bingo that you can manage in the course of a week. Going off to vote, that's kind of entertaining activity. So old people do that and they tell themselves they're fulfilling their civic duty. Maybe they are, although one of my distinguished colleagues in this room, Professor Brennan, has co-authored a paper proving decisively that there is no duty to vote. But uh, you can ask him about that if you want. Uh, but others who don't vote, you, your cohort votes a lot more than the under 18 one, even though they're affected even more than you by stuff that leads to stagnation. They have no electoral say in it. And, of course, the unborn aren't represented at all in this or in taking on pension debts and so on. So what I'm suggesting, and I hate to be so pessimistic on a beautiful day and uh, with everything so pleasant here and such great hospitality from people is that this is a serious situation. It's kind of built into liberal democracy as it is today. The building up of debt, other obligations, which are pushed forward so we don't have to deal with them now. This isn't just something that goes on in Illinois or North Carolina or even the United States, but almost everywhere in the relatively uh, uh, rich o OECD realm. Um, it's easy to enact so-called protections for people where in what's going on isn't lowering risk overall, but rather uh, reducing it for some at the expense of others. And most of the policies I've talked about are doing that. Frankly, I don't see any easy way out of this. I have some ideas for what could be done, maybe a Jeffersonian kind of thing, that all enactment of obligation come with a built-in, not a sunset clause exactly, but where future future electorate can vote to continue to honor it or say no thanks, right? Which would make it riskier to rely on it now. Um, maybe there are other means for getting around this. But I will tell you that my hunch here, and yeah, this really is pessimistic, my hunch here is that continued declines in the efficiency, productivity of our society are going to continue. Rates of growth will be decreasing and maybe even more so the kinds of social relations, openness to others so will become diminished. And that's kind of bad for me. But I won't bear up uh, under much of that. You know, I'm kind of old. Uh, I'm getting 
your uh, contributions to me now, for which I thank you and say, but it's the younger people, maybe your younger siblings, maybe your children, and they come, who will really bear this burden the most. So, uh, look, people who predict coming disasters and so usually uh, end up with egg on their face. Of course, by this time, they're probably long gone from the scene. So uh, maybe that will happen with my prediction. I hope so. Right? And uh, you can tell me about it in another 40 or 50 years. But uh, just in case, you know, uh, I think it might not be a bad idea if young people of this generation <laughs> You know, went as, uh, I need a euphemism, not as crazy as back in the 60s. But, you know, if there's a flaw I have with my students, is they're way too nice. They're not ticked off by the, these facts of exploitation, how that's doing bad stuff to them. I think they should be. I think you should be, but I urge you to wait until I've left town. Thank you.